Hello, uh, I'm Matthew and I'd like to thank you for your interest in my story. I just wanted to provide a little bit of historical context, I suppose. I wrote this about 11 or 12 years ago and uh, it, it, the story, as you'll see, concerns a man uh, called Peter and I think it's important um, to emphasise that his understanding of what the impact of living with HIV is, uh, is grounded in his ignorance in a way because of course since effective treatment became available uh, people can live perfectly healthy lives if they uh, have access to um, antiretroviral therapy and it's really important uh, I think to, to emphasise that. The story um, tries to bring together in a sense my academic interests uh, in HIV um, uh, from a legal perspective, which is the thing I've been working on for most of my academic career uh, as a researcher and as somebody interested in policy in that area, <clears throat> and also my interest in and practice of writing fiction. And so it joins those two things together. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoy the story and that it is provocative and gives you something to think about. And I wrote it in my capacity as an author um, as a fiction writer, not in my capacity as an academic. So, there you go. Hope you enjoy it. Bye. The Days He Had Seen A name is called, but not his, not yet. He doesn't have to do this. He could just get up and leave. He could walk out into the rain, raise his head up and allow it to fall against his face and onto the soft skin of his eyelids. He could open his mouth and allow it to run across his lips and onto his tongue. He could do these things, but he doesn't. He stays and he waits, focusing on the waiting room chairs, which are a sort of blue, or rather blue with the palest tint of green. And he knows that there are other colours too, which he can't see, like the pigments used in factory food. Tartrazine, curcumin, cochineal, anatto, quinoline, erythrocene. He closes his eyes and imagines the strange vivid essences being dripped from a glass pipette into a pool of water, touching and resisting, swirling and mingling until what each is has quite, quite gone. Anato, quinoline, erythrocene, erythros, the colour of blood. On the low tables beside him is a pile of magazines marked clinic, do not remove, and he wonders who might remove them and thinks maybe someone from another clinic one that has forgot to fix any labels on its own, and he smiles which feels good but then suddenly inappropriate, so he stops and coughs and picks one up. It's a copy of National Geographic from 18 months earlier, an ecology issue. He flicks through the pages until he reaches the cover story. It's about the impact of oil exploration on the North American wilderness. There's a double page aerial photograph of a bleak landscape, mile upon mile of featureless peat brown terrain stretching towards a dark serrated horizon. In the foreground a great dog or wolf appears to be howling, its size diminished by the height and angle of the shot. The ill wind of oil, reads the caption, is this the future? He runs a fingertip over the glossy paper, slowly tracing a line from the horizon to the animal. It's okay little one, he hears himself whispering, it's going to be okay. Peter? He's startled to hear his first name and looks up. A woman with a clipboard is standing by a door on the other side of the waiting room. Peter? She repeats, scanning them all without a trace of irritation. He makes a noise that doesn't come out as he'd planned, which was simply meant to be yes, but comes out in the form of a grunted susurration, so that he has to say it again louder, and the men around him raise their heads without showing their eyes. The woman smiles, beckoning for him to come, and he gets up too quickly so that the chair legs squeal like piglets against the linoleum, and the magazine falls from his lap to the floor, and he makes too much of picking it up, apologising to no one, placing it back on the table and positioning it so that it's all square, saying again, uh, yes, that's me, and trying to smile naturally, confidently, conscious that it's the smile of someone asked to pose for a photograph that he's showing too many teeth. 
If you'd like to come with me, says the woman, her smile open and gentle, and he does want to go in. He wants to go into the room and for the door to shut and for her to take his hand and hold his head and stroke his hair and let him fall asleep against her. He picks up his case and coughs and walks past her into the room which smells sweet and clean of rubbing alcohol and antiseptic and she follows him in and asks him to sit down there please and you can put your case down that's it and he says thank you for smiling and she says not a problem Peter all part of the service and her laugh is like the sound of a small clock chiming. When he was 12 Mrs Corkery took in two more foster children making three in all their names were Marion and Paul, twins, two years older than him. Peter, Paul and Marion, bless the beds that they lie on, Mrs Corkery used to chant at bedtime, each thick brogued syllable heavily belaboured as if her mouth was stuffed with a great big rubber ball. She doesn't mean it, said Paul, scratching at an elbow scarlet with eczema. She hates us. And I hate you, thought Peter, though he didn't say it because Paul was six inches taller than him and his voice had broken and he had hairs growing all over. He and Paul slept in the same room and Marion slept next door. At night, when the only sounds were the wind rattling the windows and the Westminster chime of the clock in the hall, he would sometimes hear her shouting out, indistinct and angry, and Mrs Corkery's footfall could be heard creaking the landing and the shouting would stop and the house would be quiet again. On those nights, he would lie on his side, eyes open but still half asleep, the smells from downstairs slinking under the door and into his dreams. Fried onions and drying laundry furled and branched into narrow tunnels, flecks of matter falling towards and past him at the speed of light, great trees branching and turning in on themselves, splaying and collapsing into pools of thick, dark mud. And in the next bed, Paul would moan and twist, but not wake, his legs and arms forming strange ranges in the shadow of the streetlight that filtered through the thin brown curtains. Those were the nights he dreaded most, because that's when he would become conscious of his heart beating against his ribcage. Kadung, kadung, kadung. And it was the sound he feared most, because it was inside him, and if it stopped, he would stop too, and it made him think of his mummy and her humming and the tapping of her feet to the rhythm of a song on the radio, and where was she, his mummy, and why had she gone, and when would she come for him? When will she come, chimed the bell of the hall clock as the half hour struck, when will she come? So, Peter, my name is Sarah and you've come here for an HIV test, is that right? Somebody else saying the words he's only said in his head and he falters. Uh, yes, yes, that, thanks, that's it, the test. He looks past her so that she follows his eyes and turns back because there's nothing to see except the shadow of two pigeons through the milky window. So, Peter, there are a few things I need to run through with you before we do the test itself, okay? Okay. Can you confirm your date of birth for me? August the 15th, 1957. Great, so what, you're 52 now? He nods. And have you had any symptoms that make you think you should have a test? Or have you had any sexual activity which could have put you at risk of HIV infection recently? Or is it just because you want to know? Symptoms? Anything unusual? Night sweats, weight loss, fever? Uh, no, nothing like that. Look, I... It's okay, Peter. Take your time. He concentrates on the pigeons, breathes deeply. Uh, a while back, I went to a club and I think perhaps the person was... Was it a man or a woman, Peter? He looks at the floor, follows the cracked striations of the linoleum to the far wall, shifts his weight. A man someone I sort of knew. Uh, and you think he may have been HIV positive? Uh, y yes, maybe. I, I don't know. It's fine, Peter. It's a good thing to do. It's good to know. 
Yes. And was the last time you had sex with this man more than three months ago? Yes. And you haven't been in any potentially risky situation since then? No. Okay, that's good. Great. I'll be doing a reactive test, which means we get a result in 60 seconds using a little blood from the tip of your finger. And if there's no reaction, then you're negative. And if there is, you would need to go and have a further test, okay? A further test to do what, he says? To confirm things, which would take a little bit longer, but not too long. There's just a few other questions with you, and then we can get on with the test itself. Okay, Peter? Okay. And he looks again through the window where one of the pigeons has flown off and the other is stretching, lifting first one wing and then the other and curving its neck so that through the opaque glass its silhouette looks like something else entirely, something that is being pulled slowly to pieces by thousands of invisible threads. At school, his form teacher, Miss Parker, had looked at him sideways a lot and sometimes he would look sideways back and she'd smile and he'd smile too. It was their secret sign that he was okay today, that she didn't need to worry about him. One day at the beginning of the school term after Paul and Marion came, she'd sat him next to John who couldn't read properly yet. She said, John is a very special boy in lots of ways. I wouldn't trust anyone else with this. Over four weeks they'd read Call of the Wild together, Peter moving an index finger under each word and breaking up the long ones and waiting for John to say them too. And John would get angry when he didn't see it, his mouth scrunching up and his fists tightening under the desk, his knuckles white with frustration. And sometimes Peter would stop and wait and go back to the beginning of the line and whisper the word so John could have it for free. But one day John got a long word by himself and his face burst out like a flower opening and he could see Miss Parker watching and pressing her hands together and holding them above her head and Peter knew that John would be okay too, which made everything good and everything possible. Do you want to come round mine after school tomorrow? John asked one day. They weren't reading together all the time now, only sometimes. Normally, when they had lessons in different classrooms, they sat apart because they were put in alphabetical order. But in art, they shared a table because the teacher said they could sit where they wanted. She was a woman with a pile of white hair held in place by chopsticks. Everyone thought she was weird, but Peter liked her. When she stood behind him, she would rest her hand softly on his head. Do us a grasshopper, said John. Peter was good at drawing insects. His mummy had shown him how, and she said her daddy had shown her. OK. He took a clean piece of paper and with a new pencil drew the outline, leaving a space for where the wings would be. Then he did the wings and made them lacy like in real life. He did the head and the eyes and the antennae and the little sharp bits for the mouth and he smudged the body with his thumb to make it look softer between the ridgy bits. And then he did the legs with their fine featherings and then he made a shadow so it looked as though it was sitting on something. And John sat there beside him saying nothing, concentrating, and when Peter was finished he put his initials in the corner and gave it to him and John said, write that it's for me. So Peter wrote, for my friend John, in tiny neat letters, like off the cards he'd learned handwriting from. And John said, that's dead good, that. And Peter said, well, it's for you, isn't it? And John didn't reply, but that was okay, because he knew what the silence meant. He'd been thinking about going to get tested since it happened, <clears throat> or rather, the knowledge that there was a test and that he should take it had been in his mind like an ache that he couldn't shift, an ache that swelled and subsided and swelled again each time he was feeling not quite right when his body felt off balance. He thought, it's that, it's that thing. And he could see the letters in his head, but he never said them out loud. And when he thought them, they were always just 
out of focus, lilting like strands of kelp to the left and to the right, never fixing, and just when he thought he'd got them to stay still so that he could hold them there, confront them, they'd slide away sideways, out of reach. And what, he'd thought for a long time, is the point. Either it's there in me and I can't do anything about that, or it's not. And more than that, he'd thought, I don't want to know this about myself, it's too much to know. And he would lie in bed listening to the wind in the trees and not sleeping, and his heart would start thumping, kadung, 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 and he'd turn this way, then that, pulling a pillow between his side and his arm to muffle the thumping, but still it sounded an incessant and terrifying pulsing, pushing his blood into his brain and his arms and his legs, and there'd be an ache in his groin that wasn't there before, a dull pressure that would become all he could think about, because that's what they said, isn't it? that your lymph nodes swell, trying to fight it off, in your neck, in your armpits, between your legs, all those white blood cells swarming, trying to deal with this thing that tricked them and sidled off, waiting, replicating, filling you up, making you weak and unable to fight until it was too late, and your skin came out in purple lesions, and you got pneumonia and they filled you with chemicals while you wasted, in a bed where no one came to see you and you died even though you had already somehow died because this virus was a signifier of your mortality that made you already dead like a zombie and nobody could see it until your cheeks hollowed and your eyes fell back into their sockets like marbles in quicksand. And still the wind brushed the leaves off the trees while his heart beat hard in its cage. Kadung, kadung. Kadung, and still he could not th stop the sound of it. He could not stop the sound. Is John your boyfriend then? <clears throat> he was sitting with Paul and Marion, having tea in the kitchen. What's that? said Mrs Corkery, who they called Mrs Corkery, who had no other name. Marion kicked Paul under the table and he yelped, smirking. Peter concentrated hard on the ingredients of a packet of iced biscuits and didn't look up. Tartrazine, curcumin and cochineal, anatto, quinoline, erythrocene. Peter's going to tea with his friend tomorrow. Don't you think I don't know that now and isn't that nice for him? He's the stupidest boy in the school. He can't even read properly. Well, we are not all blessed with your abnormal gifts, Paul, and you should not speak like that about people. It's not godly. Peter would have smiled if Mrs Corkery's comment had meant to make him feel better, but it was intended only to put down Paul, just as he knew that the visits to Marion in the night were only to stop the moaning that kept her from sleeping. Peter knew this about Mrs Corkery because her eyes stayed cold and dark when she spoke and sat like sleeping spiders in their sockets. John didn't live far away, but they had to cross the park and it was raining. Do you know you're real, Mum? he said. Course, said Peter. Why did she go away? It's not for always. I didn't say it was, did I? She's coming back soon. When? Soon. They walked past the boathouse where all the boats were moored up because it was March and the sides of them ground together, croaking and creaking. John stopped and leaned over the railings. When they get them out for the summer time, will you go on one of those with me, if you like? I'll be rower. OK. Because I'm stronger than you, said John. No, you're not. And faster. Not. Am. Aren't. And with that, Peter biffed John on the arm and took off like a greyhound across the grass. Bet you can't catch me, Peter shouted into the wind, and John took off too after him. They ran past the children's playground, arcing round the top of the lake, where a gaggle of grazing geese hissed and fanned their wings and made Peter lose his rhythm so that he tripped forward, nearly falling, but righting himself just in time to prevent John from tagging him and onwards they charged, fierce and proud, 
and limber limbed, legs like pistons, satchels bouncing, arms and fists like the bars on the wheels of speeding steam trains. And it seemed to Peter, with the rain in his face and the wind in his hair, trousers brown with the spatter of mud, that he could run like this to the end of the earth. And it wasn't the catching that mattered. It wasn't the winning. It was running and running and feeling the intake of air in his lungs like an engine, the rush of aliveness, of rocketing forward so no one could stop him. Not now, not no one, not never, not know how. Peter reached the gate first, his heart pounding. You're pretty fast, you are, panted John, hands on his knees, hair and blazer steaming. That was slow, said Peter. You're so full of crap. At least I don't steam like it. Don't so. Do so. Come on, let's get us some tea. And they dawdled along the streets, kicking at stones and scraping railings until at last they reached John's house. It looked like the house Peter had lived in with his mummy and he felt his stomach knot. Ma'am! John shouted through the letterbox. Ma'am! I'm coming, I'm coming, honest to goodness. And there was something about the voice, something familiar that made Peter start. The door opened and there stood Miss Parker, his teacher, smiling face on instead of sideways. Hello, Peter. Uh, Miss Parker, I'm Mrs Davis here in this house. I'm John's mum. And Peter looked at John who said, gotcha and raced wah wah wahing into the house, kicking off his shoes and throwing his satchel against the wall. I, I don't understand, said Peter. Here, give me your blazer and go and wash yourself and get John to give you a pair of clean trousers. What on earth have you been doing? Running in the park, I, I didn't mean to get messy, sorry. You're not at school now, no apologising. I'll explain over tea. Now, run along, shoo and she pushed him into the house which smelled of bread and flowers and polished wood and where somewhere, muffled behind a door, piano music was playing and made Peter stop suddenly and close his eyes and the muscles in his fingers fizzed and sparked and twitched and then were still again. And Mrs Davis looked at him sideways and he opened his house and smiled sideways back to tell her it was okay, that she didn't need to worry. So, Peter, we can do the test now if you're ready for that. He nods and Sarah takes the contents from a box and lays them on the table beside her. A small pot, a bit like an inkwell with blotting paper in it, some small files of clear liquid and a small red plastic thing. What I have to do is to take a sample of blood from the tip of your finger with this. She's unwrapped and holds in her hand the small red plastic thing. Mix it with this, she holds up one of the files, and then pour it in here. She gestures at the pot. Peter nods again. What we're looking for <clears throat> is one dot on the blotter. That will show us that it's a valid test. Valid, says Peter that there's enough blood for us to be able to test the sample. Okay, then I'll pour in the contents of the other bottles and 60 seconds later, we'll know where we stand, okay? Okay. He didn't hear the voice at first. The music in the club was pounding and there were people pressed up against him, chests and biceps wet with perspiration and he couldn't move. Peter, it's me, louder this time. John, John Davis. He felt a hand on his shoulder and managed at last to turn round, knocking the drink of a man with a dragon tattoo on his shoulder so that it splashed back onto his vest. Mind yourself, will ya? Uh, sorry, sorry, I didn't. But Dragon Man was already pushing his way back through the steaming heave of frantic, blank-faced men, nodding rhythmically and jiggling his free hand as if he had a pair of dice in it, ready for rolling. Peter looked back at the man who had called his name, but it was dark, strobe lights flashing, and he couldn't really see John from school, John. Yes, you twat. Who else? Here, give me that and follow me. 
and he took Peter's drink and cut a path through the people to a room where it was suddenly quieter and the thumping music seemed like it had been wrapped in something thick and woolly. Peter held his hands against his ears to see if the buzzing would stop, but it, but it stayed there, low and persistent. Got the ringing? My ears are fucked, totally fucked like everything else. They managed to find a bench seat behind a pillar and sat down. The leatherette was sticky and crusted. Well, fucking well, Peter Pygo, who'd have thought it? Peter focused on a dark stain on the floor. Well, aren't you going to say something? You've got to admit, it's pretty weird. It's good to see you again, John, said Peter. Still the gentleman, I see. My ma'am always said that about you, rated you, she did. H how is she? Dead, cancer, six years ago now. Peter feels a claw in his heart. I I'm sorry. Shit happens. And yours? I don't know, she didn't. A narrow hallway, a pair of cream sandals, a hand on his shoulder, the soft tick-tocking of a mantle clock, a small brown leather suitcase. Kadung. But what about you, John? You look just the same. And he could tell John knew he was lying because he'd changed a lot. The coarse brown curly hair had been shaved off and the skin on his face was grey and creased and waxy. His eyes at least were the same, like new-shelled conkers, and he still had the same cocky smile, the crooked front tooth that zagged across the other. Just the same. Give me a break, but you're still as handsome as you always were. Peter looked at his glass and concentrated on a smudged grey thumbprint just below the rim. He could feel the blood rising up his neck and into his face. Well, well, your eyes are just how I remember, and and your mouth. Perhaps you're a bit thinner, but no, you look you look great. Really, you do. John lit a cigarette and inhaled deeply. Flirting will get you everywhere. Anyway, I always thought you were queer. Shame we never got together sooner when we were at school. I don't think Mum would have minded. She thought you were a catch. I wasn't then, I didn't. Yeah, yeah, whatever. And John leaned over and pinched Peter's cheek. He smelled of sweat and wet ash and cheap cologne. All it takes is the right man and the right occasion. So, how long have you been frequenting dens of iniquity like this then? Uh, it's only the second time, actually. I, I don't, you know, only when you get the horn, that it. Well, Christ, Peter Pygo. Do you remember that time you came round mine the first time? The look on your face when you realised Mam and Miss Parker was the same person. Precious. I remember running through the park with you in the rain. It was only because she thought it were best if the other kids didn't know, you know, what with my dyslexia and her being the teacher and all. She was kind to me that afternoon, I remember. She was a kind woman and he remembered jam tarts and sweet tea in fat handled mugs and then hearing the piano music again and sitting on the floor closing his eyes and playing the piece in the air his fingers dancing and flying and he remembered opening his eyes and seeing john's mother watching him from the doorway and knowing she could tell that for him this was a real piano not pretend and that he could play like an angel that he was extraordinary magnificent prodigious and him saying don't tell i don't want anyone to know i can and her saying it'll be our secret and taking his hand in hers and wiping his eyes so john wouldn't see and saying it's going to be okay peter it's going to be okay you look like you're away with the fairies uh, sorry it's it's odd what you remember that's all I try not to remember much myself. Live in the present. That's my motto. Has to be. Cheers. Cheers, John. Good health. Whatever. And they clinked their glasses and drained those. And John bought some more. And then so did he. And it got later and later. And John said, what about shots? And Peter, who was beginning to feel a bit fuzzy, but loose-limbed 
and happy said that he should really go home but why not what's there to go home for and they smoked every last cigarette and drank tequila and vodka and he fell against John and it felt good and John kissed him and twisted his hair between his fingers and said let's go back to mine shall we and Peter laughed and said why not why the fuck not and John laughed at him swearing and said take one of these and gave him a pill that was blue or a sort of blue with a hint of green and Peter took it and John said at a boy and grabbed his hand and held it tight as they walked out under stars that were fading one by one into a sky turning gold as the earth rolled forward into the sunlight. The nurse takes the middle finger of his left hand and massages the tip with her thumb. Ready? Yep. She pushes the end of the red thing and it punctures his finger and a globule of scarlet appears and swells and drips over the side of his finger. He can feel the sweat on his brow and the nerves in his fingertip. He fights off the instinct to retract his hand. That's great, she says as she sucks the blood into a tiny tube. You have very strong fingers and lots of the red stuff. Excellent. I used to play the piano when I was a boy. He looks over to where he'd seen the pigeon, but there's no sign of it. And that's it. Great. All done. She drops the contents of the tube into one of the files where it falls and feathers in slowly spiring ling filaments until it's quite, quite gone. She pours this into the well where it disappears into the blotting paper. She watches and he watches too and presses a hand against his chest and notices that she sees this and scratches to make her think it's only an itch. And as they watch, a blue spot appears. Great, so it's a valid test. Now all we have to do is this and she carefully pours in the contents first of one file and waits and then of the other and waits and Peter thinks this is it, it's come to this particular moment and it's like everything is funneling in and down and in his mind he sees a coin being dropped into one of those stripy conical glass covered bowls in the amusement arcade circling on its rim for what seems like ever and ever round and round and faster and faster until at last it disappears rattling into the dark narrow well at the centre. Well, says the nurse, we have a result. Can you see that? He looks at the single blue dot on the blotting paper. That's it. That's it. We don't have to wait any longer. No, that's it. It's a negative result. So that means that you're okay, Peter. It means everything's going to be okay. But he doesn't really hear her because he's remembering words from a book he once read that he thought he'd forgotten. He was older than the days he had seen, he says to himself, and the breaths he had drawn. And all he can think of is coursing through the park with the wind in his hair and a boy with crooked teeth and a face like a flower bursting and the photograph of a wolf in the wilderness howling. Mm -hmm.